I'm going to talk about uh, sort of a mathematical version of, of, of the problem that uh, Michel Campillo uh, discussed yesterday. So, uh, so this is related to some, uh, let's say, mathematical model of, of, uh, of imaging with waves uh, that are generated by, by some uh, noise sources. And uh, the goal is to recover the, the speed of sound in the, in the governing wave equation. And this is based on, on, on joint, joint work with uh, Tapio Helin, Matti Lassas, and, and Teemu Saksala. And Matti and Teemu are also in the audience. So uh, you can also discuss with them if you want about this, um, this topic. So this ambient noise uh, tomography, of course, it's, uh, it's well known in the, in the context of uh, geophysical imaging, and it, it, it goes back to these uh, foundational papers by, by Michel Campillo and his uh, co-authors, and of course there's many, many more papers, uh, and I'm not going to, to, to review them. I'm not even able to review them, really. I'm, I'm a mathematician, so I know the problem much better in the, in the mathematical context, and the, uh, there is a nice um, monograph by Garnier and Papa Nicolaou, uh, from 2016, and this is basically the book that I used to learn the, uh, the problem myself. And, and there are uh, also some other people involved uh, in the study of this problem on the mathematical side, like, uh, like uh, Colin de Verdier, for instance. So uh, somehow to summarize the theory in this, uh, in this book uh, is to say that uh, the Green's function can be recovered from these uh, uh, noise signals in the leading order by studying some correlations of this uh, recorded noise. And um, now the leading order, uh, what, what this means in practice is that uh, one gets some information about travel times and, and also by studying maybe the, the leading order amplitudes in some sense, mathematical sense, uh, some integrated quantities over some rays. And, and then these type of quantities lead to, uh, to uh, problems like, like this boundary rigidity problem that Andras Vasi uh, described yesterday. And typically these sort of um, problems then can be solved only under some additional geometric assumptions related to some sort of convexity typically. Now what we, we do in this work is, is that we show that the, the Green's function can be actually completely recovered from these uh, ambient noise correlations. And then uh, that reduces the problem to a deterministic problem that actually can be solved completely, at least in the mathematical sense. So in, in, a, in a certain <coughs> mathematical model case that, uh, that I will describe in the next slide, we can, in a sense, solve the problem completely. So we, we start from noise correlations and we get uh, actually the, uh, the wave speed. And, and this is, uh, I suppose, in line with, uh, with what Michel uh, uh, told us yesterday, that uh, uh, studying these correlations of the noise, you can actually recover the coda of the, of the Green's. Uh, Green's function. And uh, <clears throat> this mathematical theory, this deterministic theory where, that we are going to reduce the problem to, uses essentially the information in the coda. Okay. So uh, the model is, is, is like this. Uh, so we have um, so we have acoustic wave equation. So this is a very simplistic model, I guess, for, for seismic uh, uh, imaging people. But we have just the acoustic wave equation with some space-dependent speed of sound here. Uh, we have a, a source generating some waves here on the right-hand side. So here, uh, this W is the most uh, in interesting object on the right-hand side. So it's a single real realization of the white noise uh, in space and time. And then this kappa somehow encodes where the the noise is, is coming from, so it can enforce some sort of localization, and also the, uh, it can model the strength, uh, special, specially varying strength of the noise. Uh, <clears throat> then there is some, uh, some uh, initial conditions here and, and some sort of smooth transition from uh, zero to, to one uh, near the time origin. So these are not 
very essential terms. We just include them so that we can model everything sort of using uh, exact mathematical theory. And in fact, uh, we record uh, then correlations in time of, of the corresponding solution to this equation. And we are interested in the large time asymptotics of these uh, time averages. So in fact, uh, these uh, gray terms are sort of transient terms. And when you take large time asymptotics, they, you can just ignore them. But we will include them just to be able to model everything in a, uh, using sort of causal time domain wave equation. So here, I mean, uh, these correlations will be the, the information that we have. Uh, this speed of sound is the quantity we want to recover. Uh, and basically, everything else is also unknown. So uh, this kappa can be unknown. And uh, we don't know which particular realization of the white noise we have. So we know the statistics, but we don't know what, what is the, the actual realization. And uh, OK, so we assume that this uh, speed of sound is completely smooth, which is, again, something that, uh, I mean, uh, we study sort of a very simple mathematical model case here. OK. So we, we need some, some more assumptions in order to, to solve the problem completely. And let's, let me now uh, tell you about this. Um, so OK, so here I have just reduced everything from the previous slide. So I have the equation and the correlations. And then we assume that we have some uh, set called capital X in the, in the space. And we assume that this, uh, this kappa here that sort of encodes the spatial localization of the, so of the noise is not vanishing here in this, in this particle set X. And then we assume that these uh, correlations are actually their limit in time. So in this uh, uh, time average, I mean, this, this capital T that tells how, how long we average in time. So we, we take the limit, uh, so look large times in this averaging. And uh, we assume that the, these correlations are then known uh, for all points in space in this set X. Okay. So I don't know if, if it's possible to, is it possible to draw here? No. OK, well, OK. So, but I mean, think that I mean, we have some, some, some sets set in, in space where, where the measurements are sort of localized. And we want to recover then the speed of sound also away from that, that set. Thanks. OK, so I can, I can, I can draw here. Yeah. So, so this is where our data is. And then we want to recover the speed of sound somewhere possibly also far away. OK, so, so that's one assumption, that, uh, that this kappa that encodes the localization of the noise is not vanishing here on the, on, on the set x. And then we need one uh, sort of geometric assumption on the, on the speed of sound. So and it is related to uh, statistical stability of this correlation quantity. So, uh, <clears throat> so if you think this, this quantity for any fixed time, so you are averaging only over finite time interval, then uh, this is random in the sense that it depends on the particular realization of the, of the noise process, right? So u is a solution to the wave equation with the realization of the white noise as a source. So this u is random in the sense that it depends on the realization. So also does uh, this uh, correlation then depend on, on the realization. But uh, as you may expect, if there is some ergodicity and you average in time, in the limit when, time, uh, when this averaging goes to infinity, you actually get something deterministic out. And in order to show that this is really the case, uh, to prove this mathematically, we assume this uh, what I call non-trapping assumption for the speed of sound. So uh, it assumes that, so we assume that uh, outside some really large set, so I have some large region here. And outside here, the speed of sound is just one. So again, probably not extremely realistic assumption in the, from the point of view of um, uh, geophysical imaging. But this is what we assume. And then also, we assume that uh, if, you, if you think about now array, 
uh, corresponding the speed of sound. You s start this ray from this uh, set, then it must escape in both ways outside this uh, into this zone where, where where speed of sound is one. So this is what I mean by non-trapping. So all the rays come out, and then after some time, they will actually be very trivial ones. So they will be just straight lines in this, in this exterior region here. And under this assumption, we can show that uh, this limit is statistically stable in the sense that it, it is completely deterministic. It doesn't depend on the particular realization of this noise. And in fact, uh, the proof is, is based on, on what is called the local energy decay for the for the wave equation, so that means sort of, uh, physically that the energy escapes to the infinity. And, and this uh, is one particular set of geometric assumptions that guarantee that this uh, energy decay property holds for the, for the wave equation. So if there are some, some rays that stay forever in a compact region like this, you won't get that good energy decay. Okay. And of course, uh, yeah, so there are two components. So there is this local energy decay, and then we use some, uh, so that guarantees that, that, that uh, you can use some uh, classical ergodic theorem uh, to get, uh, uh, to see that this is actually deterministic. Okay, and I will, I will, I mean, I will try to explain how to see this and, and understand this limit uh, sort of very explicitly uh, after a couple of slides. But let me first formulate now the, the actual result. So again, I mean, here is the model. We have the wave equation. We have the correlations. And we have two assumptions. Uh, so we have a set where our data is, and uh, this kappa cannot vanish in that set. And then we have this geometric non-trapping assumption. And then under these two assumptions, we can show that this limit, when you average over very large times, and you know the, the correlations in this set x, this uh, uniquely determines the, the speed of sound in this uh, Wave equation. Almost surely, okay. So it means that uh, there is sort of set of measure zero where you can, maybe something crazy can happen in terms of choosing the realization here. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> let me now recall. So uh, as I said, the source is, is modeled by, by white noise. So let me recall what, uh, what is this white noise. So first of all, let me use this sort of notation. So for this sort of bracket, I mean that I, I take a product of two functions, u and phi, and integrate over the whole space time. And I, I use z to denote, denote points in, in space time. And in fact, uh, if you are really sort of squeaky clean mathematically, you should think this as a, as a pairing between distribution and test function because this uh, white noise is actually a very sort of non-smooth thing. But you can also think this as, as, I mean, there are generalizations of integrals anyway. So, uh, <clears throat> so now this uh, white noise can be defined by saying that it's a Gaussian random variable uh, that has zero mean and, and, and its covariance or col correlation is, 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 is given by this sort of uh, expression. So this says that somehow if you have, uh, so, so you integrate the, the white noise against some function phi and also against some other function psi, and then you take the, the average or the mean, or the expectation. Uh, that then is just the integral or, or the inner product of this uh, phi and psi. So it means that, for instance, if, if phi and psi are supported in completely different places, uh, there is no correlation. So this somehow says that the correlation is extremely local. Okay, and then uh, I can think that my uh, this this uh, correlation process, this uh, c of uh, c sub sub t, is is uh, I mean the data that I have is a realization of this random variable, right? That is generated now by this white noise process through solving uh, this. Uh, wave equation and then plugging into this expression. So uh, the order to, in order to understand this statistical stability, I will do one uh, simple integration by parts. So, uh, <clears throat> so let's see. 
So I take some uh, smooth function that is supported in here in, in space here in this set where I have data, and, and just some arbitrary finite time interval. And I solve the wave equation backwards in time with this f as a source on the right hand side. And then I also, okay, so here I've introduced a, a simple notation. So this u sub s is just a, a shift in time of, of, of my solution to the, to the previous, I mean, to the wave equation on the previous slide where the, this u is now generated by the white noise process. So now if I have this shift at u and I integrate it against f, then I can, of course, write f by, by this v because V solves this, uh, this wave equation with F on the right hand side, and then I just integrate by parts so that this wave operator hits now U, but U solves the wave equation with white noise source uh, with this shifting, okay? But the white noise is, is translation invariant, so if you shift it around, you still get the white noise, so I can, I can drop this shift in here, and then what I have is, is a shift in this cutoff that I had in the right hand side of the equation, but when S becomes large, this, this sort of this transient part becomes negligible. So I will just, uh, I, won't, I, won't, I won't do the details for that, but just trust me that I can ignore this chi naught part. And then uh, if I put everything together, I start by, uh, I start by my um, correlations here. I integrate them against two functions. Of, of this kind, so li living on the set where I have data. And I take the expectation and the limit in, in time. And I, then I just uh, exchange some orders of integrations here. So, uh, so these integrals here in space that uh, correspond to integrating against f and h, they go to these two brackets here. And this integral in time averages just comes from the definition of, of these correlations. And yeah, that's it. Then I just change some orders and I get this expression here. And now I use this uh, uh, integration by pass that I just explained. So this expectation becomes uh, expectation where I this white noise. I just, uh, I ignore this uh, transition period. So I, I just throw it away. It, it won't, I mean, it will vanish in the limit. And, and this kappa is left. So I, I, this kappa appears there. there. And now I use the defining property of, of the white noise. So this gives me the deterministic integral where I uh, pair these two, so, possibly two different solutions to this equation with uh, f and h on, on, on the right hand side. And now, if I have ergodicity here, I'm actually basically oh, averaging here twice in the same way. Uh, so I can actually drop one of these. So this is how, how this, uh, this, this is sort of the explicit form of this statistical stability here. So uh, again, under this uh, geometric assumption, it holds almost surely that when I take the limit and I do the pairing as is in the previous slide, and uh, I will just get this deterministic inner product between two, two uh, solutions to the wave equation, like this. And the only sort of constraint here is that this f and age that appear as sources on the right hand side must be supported here in this set where I have my data. And okay, so that's it. So that's how, how, how we can understand quite easily uh, this, this limit and there is absolutely no approximations here. So this is just uh, good and honest equality. So now what I want to explain next is uh, how you can extract now the Green's function from these inner products. And I make, I'm going to make some uh, simplifications just to keep the argument simple and not to get bogged. Yes? What's Sorry? What's so kappa, uh, yeah, let's go a couple of slides back. So it is sort of the, uh, uh, encodes the strength and the spatial localization of this noise. Uh, in fact, I mean, we don't have to assume that it's known. So it can be also unknown in the problem, and, and we can recover it. But I was actually just about to say that we, now I'm not going to make this simplification and, and hide that fact. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to now assume that the kappa is actually one, 
and, and, and show how, how, to, how to recover the rest. But you can, I mean, in, in our paper, we also recover kappa. But that's an additional step, some sort of pre-processing that you need to do. But now, um, okay, as I said, let's now assume that kappa is just one here in this set where I have data, so simplify things. Let me also assume that I know already the speed of sound, but only in this set where I have data in the, here in, in, in X. So really the challenge in this problem is to figure out what happens outside this set where I have data. So if you can believe me, I mean, you can, you can play some, I mean, you have lots and lots of data here, of course, where, I mean, where everything happens, I mean, where you collect the data. So it's not that hard to figure out what, what, are, what are kappa and, and, and the speed of sound here. But of course, the, the challenge is somehow to do this sort of remote sensing here. Okay, so, so yeah, so just to simplify things, uh, I assume that we have already recovered kappa and C there. And then just to get, uh, just to, uh, get a bit more natural notation in what follows, I will reverse time. So uh, recall that we previously we, we had some solutions to the wave equation backwards in time, but of course it's time reversible. So I mean, I lose nothing by, by thinking that I actually have solutions forward, forward in time just to, to keep the language a bit more natural. So I'm not now going to show how to, how to recover Green's functions from, from these uh, inner products here. Now, uh, corresponding to the solutions to the wave equation in a forward direction. Okay. Uh, so this is a, a Green's function. I mean, knowing Green's function is actually equivalent of, of, of being able to solve this wave equation and, and recording the solution. Uh, here where I have data. So, yeah, so, okay, so I'm not going to recover the Green's, Green's function completely, but I'm going to recover Green's function restricted on this set where I have data first. So, knowing that Green's function there is the same thing as being able to solve this wave equation and, and knowing what the solution is localized here in the set of data, right? And uh, <clears throat> now, so what I want to do is, is I want to sort of undo this product and integration here, right? I want to recover just Vf from these quantities. And that would be probably impossible if I would have these inner products only for fixed age. But the trick is, of course, to now start changing this age and, 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 and keeping F fixed. Or vice versa. I think I, I actually did it vice versa in the next slide. And, and <coughs> The way that it, uh, this, this trick works is that you want to sort of localize first everything here in, the, in this set where you have data here in X. And we want to first figure out what are the sources that correspond to solutions that never actually leave this set. So I call these non-radiating solutions. So uh, these are solutions that when you, when you put F, let's say in some small subregion here in, in X, uh, the corresponding solutions stays in the, in the same small subregion forever. I mean, it sort of doesn't propagate in time. And, and there is a simple trick to find those. At least, I mean, this is not, comp I mean, this is, I don't, I'm not going to give you an algorithm, but just a sort of mathematical proof that you will have a sort of non-constructive procedure to find those, uh, or some sort of procedure to find those. So, uh, so I'm, I'm claiming that, okay, uh, taking F, uh, now this is a picture now in space time. So this cylinder here, uh, uh, denoted by this, okay, maybe I'll draw it here again. So this cylinder here has a base that is my set X where the data is, right? And then time is up. And then, I take here some small set B, and I say that, okay, let's now take F so that it's supported here in the, it is, it is vanishing outside B. And then uh, we take some sort of large cylinder that sits on top of the small cylinder, and we look for those Fs such that these inner products that are now assumed to be known are zero for all ages that are sources now sitting here on top. 
So if this vanishes, no matter how you choose age, then it means that uh, the, uh, this f somehow generates a wave that never leaves this b. And uh, <coughs> there is a simple trick to see that, well, I mean, this is a sketch of proof. This is not complete proof, but, but the, the idea is simply that, well, take any, any, any function that uh, is, is here in, in, in Q and vanishes elsewhere, and just define your age to be the wave operator applied to that function, and then essentially by definition, uh, this just becomes phi. And, uh, <coughs> and then there are plenty and plenty of functions uh, that you can put here. So if this vanishes, this vf must vanish in the whole gray box. And that's, that's basically the proof. Uh, so yeah, so VH is 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 solution to this wave equation with H in place of F as a source, right? So I'm sort of testing two things. So I'm sort of setting F here, and I want to test if if it if it really produces something that starts to propagate, right? And then I'm taking this other box here. I'm putting H here as a source and check if there is sort of any interaction between the corresponding solutions. And if there is not, and, and I vary sort of a, uh, age through many, many functions, then in fact this f didn't produce anything that leaves from this set b. So that's the idea. And then, uh, then we are almost done. Uh, <coughs> so now uh, I just take all these solutions all these sources that, that correspond to solutions that, that, that doesn't start to propagate. And, in, and then, because they don't start to propagate, they actually are sort of completely isolated in this set X. So in, in particular, they satisfy a boundary condition, vanishing boundary condition on the boundary of X. And I can just solve this wave equation for those sources. I mean, I cannot sol solve the wave equation for all sources because I don't know what happens. I mean, I don't know the, the speed of sound uh, outside X, right? But I know it, I assume that I know it in X. So once I have done this isolation, I can just solve this in X. And then, uh, then the idea is to, to plug here one of these solutions to be a solution that is completely isolated in X. And as we discussed on the last slide, there are many, many of, of them. So these inner products actually then determine completely the other factor. And this other factor now can be something that has propagated and reflected back uh, through this unknown region. And that then gives me the, the Green's function. Because now I can, I can find out one of the factors and uh, for any source here in X, it sort of starts to send some waves to the unknown region, they might reflect back, and then you can read it, read the corresponding wave by, by, by sort of undoing this uh, product and integration here, as I explained. Okay, so that gives me the, the Green's function. Now, uh, <coughs> there is a, a good mathematical theory to recover uh, the speed of sound given the Green's function restricted on some open set. So in fact, this set can be completely arbitrary as long as, uh, I mean, it's not empty. And you can always uh, recover uh, the speed of sound. And in fact, you can do this, uh, I mean, you can really do this uh, at least in some synthetic uh, examples uh, by, by using some, uh, I mean, by, by doing some computer simulation. So this is not, completely theoretical construction. So, I mean, this uh, thing here we haven't tried numerically, but we have, have tried numerically how to, how to then recover uh, speed of sound from Green's function. And let me now uh, switch gears slightly and discuss that step. But for that step, I'm not going to, to, to discuss much about proof, but just to sort of maybe try to give you the, the flavor and show some pictures, so some actual reconstructions. So, uh, or at least one. Uh, <clears throat> okay, but I'm, I'm going to also switch gears in the sense that I, I'm going to 
change my setting slightly because we did the numerics in a different setting. So, uh, <coughs> so instead of uh, having this Green's function localized here in this x, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm thinking that I have the Green's function localized on, on the surface of some, some part of the Earth, let's say. So, and I'm, I'm going to model it like this. So again, uh, there seems to be a slightly, uh, I mean, the language in, in maths community and in, in geophysics imaging community is, is slightly different. So instead of speaking about Green's functions, we typically want to discuss about some operators and so on. But this is completely equivalent description. So, so the setting will be as follows. So instead of having a source here, as I, I had earlier, I have some boundary, and I put the source there on the boundary in this sort of Neumann sense. And, and then I record the corresponding solution also on the boundary. So I think that I have this information at hand that for any source on the boundary gives me the corresponding so, uh, solution restricted on the boundary. Uh, but this is, of course, the same thing as, as knowing Green's function restricted on this uh, boundary. Now, uh, the problem at hand is then to, to, to find this, the speed of sound given this uh, uh, this map that is usually called Neumann to Dirichat map. And it's well known in the maths community that this problem has unique solution. And it, it means that if I'm given this uh, map, I can determine C completely. And that we don't need any uh, a priori information, so we don't need any initial guess. So this is sort of completely global, one shot thing. And uh, there are actually several ways to do this. But um, the way that I want to, I mean, the, the method that I want to discuss now is, is called the boundary control method. And uh, this, is a, this is a method that really uses time domain features. And, and it has particular advantage over all the other methods that I know. Uh, that, uh, is, uh, that it can be localized in a, in a sense by, by doing some windowing in time. And this is, uh, this is why we want to work in, in, in time domain. So we want to do some windowing in time. And, and that is really good because it sort of allows us to, to break the problem in, in some tractable smaller problems. And, and in, in principle, from the mathematical point of view, we can actually treat arbitrarily complex geometries. So the, the wave speed can be arbitrarily complex in this, set, uh, in this step of the, of the method. So there can be actually be, be some trapping and whatever in principle. Uh, <coughs> And also, because of this good localization properties, we can, we can solve the problem by, uh, when we have very sort of local data. So if we are interested in recovering something just uh, below us here in this room, in principle, that's possible using the, the method as long as we have some uh, ways to, to input energy and, and read out the reflections uh, in this room and in the, in the floor. So. <clears throat> And even in principle, we can start with local data, just let's say measure in very high precision what happens on the, on the floor here. Uh, yeah, in principle, in the mathematical uh, sense, we can recover the whole interior of the Earth. Of course, that's in practice unrealistic. Uh, what, is, what is really the disadvantage of this method that somehow it gets its analytical power from uh, a unique continuation result by Tataru? And unfortunately, this sort of technique is, is very unstable. So in principle, we can recover everything. But in practice, it's so unstable that it's, actually, it, it's, it's really hard to implement this method. And uh, except maybe in, in when the spatial dimension is one, then everything is actually very easy. Uh, so what we need to do in practice when we implement this method computationally, we need to somehow trade resolution in order to gain some stability in, in the computation. And, and I will show you some pictures so you get an idea uh, sort of how much we, we, we lose in this trade, in, in a sense. But there is, uh, I mean, there is this um, hope that we can get a, a good initial guess using this mathematical method uh, that we can then input to some more traditional methods uh, that, that do some local data fitting. For instance, full waveform inversion, or maybe some, I don't know, machine learning technique. OK, so <coughs> this um, method goes uh, back to, to Belyshev in late 80s. 
and there is a sort of geometric version uh, of, the, of the method that goes to Belyshev and Kurilev. And in some sense, the, in a sense, the complete theory of, of, of this method in, from the theoretical point of view is, is contained in a, this monograph by Kachalov, Kurilev, and Lassus. And, 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 and this is sort of the, the history of, of computational implementations of the method. So there were some early attempts. And there is some variation of the method that is actually quite interesting. But uh, it doesn't use this, uh, this sort of idea of, of, of time windowing. So it's, it's, it's slightly different. And, and for instance, you cannot do this sort of local data problems using that variation. I did some. Uh, uh, computational study of, of just an obstacle detection. So that means that I have homogeneous medium and there is some sort of sound hard scatterer there and I just want to recover the sound hard scatterer. So that's sort of the easiest, in a sense, the easiest problem that you can try. So I, I did some numerical uh, work on that. And there is a, a recent work by Belyshev and, and his co-authors that is uh, sort of close to, to what I'm going to present, I mean, the, the numerical results that I'm no, now going to present. Uh, well, first of all, let, let me just show you that in, in, in 1 plus 1D, so one spatial dimension, everything, everything works actually very, very well. So if I consider the, the problem in 1D, and I have here some, some source, a single source is enough in 1D, uh, that is uh, some smoothed out version of a, of a point source. Mm then we can, we can just compute uh, the speed of sound in a very uh, stable way. So here, uh, I think the, the blue line is, is, is the actual wave speed and the, the reconstruction in this smooth case is so close to the true that you cannot even really see the difference. So there is some small amount of noise added here. But we can actually add quite a lot of noise. Of course, the, the reconstruction gets worse, but it, we can still do it in a stable way. Here is some uh, uh, speed of sound that is actually discontinuous. So okay, so blue line is actually the computer, the reconstruction, and then the, the dashed line here is, is the true one. So now, I mean, we don't get the corners completely right, but the reconstruction is very good, and it's very stable, and there are no oscillations or anything like that. But in 1D, everything works because actually in 1D this sort of the, the analytical engine, the unique continuation is essentially stable. So, uh, and that's very different in the, in the multi-D case. So here is an example uh, with, uh, with Martin and, and Paul Kepley that we did in 2D. So, uh, so the idea is here that, okay, so think that this, this is a, as a 2D model of some earth. Uh, so, so the ground is here in top. We have some maybe about 100 or a bit more than 100 sources here that are point-like. And we record, uh, I mean, the data for each of these shots. And then uh, this is the, the image of the true wave speed. So it, is, it has this gradient and then it has some lensing here, which makes the problem uh, non-trivial. And uh, <coughs> so here is what we get. I mean, here is the reconstruction. So this is in a funny region, and I will explain you later why this looks a bit funny. But we get pretty good re uh, uh, recovery of the, of the speed of sound in this region. But you see that, I mean, the speed of sound is very smooth here, although it's non-trivial because there is this lensing. Uh, but still, I mean, uh, we have, let's say, 100 sources here, a bit more. And, and this is sort of the resolution that we get. So we cannot get more features uh, easily. So this is uh, what I mean but by, by saying that we need to trade some resolution in order to, to be able to compute this in a stable way. And here are some comparisons. So, uh, <coughs> so again, I mean, this is our reconstruction. And there are some cross sections that uh, you, uh, show the error in the reconstruction. So blue is, is the true speed of sound along this cross section A here. And, and these red dots are the, the reconstruction. So, we certainly make some error here in the very end of the cross section. But I mean, overall, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, and, and you see that, I mean, this lens that we have, I mean, there is certainly some, some focusing. And this is what, what poses difficulties. I think many, many methods will be confused by this sort of multipathing. And as I said, the boundary control method somehow 
uh, bypasses this uh, difficulty by, by doing some clever time windowing. Uh, <clears throat> but then we can recover the speed of sound only in this funny looking region, at least in the beginning. In principle, we can uh, iterate this procedure and sort of push the data through the region that we already know and repeat. Uh, but we haven't tried that really numerically. In some sense, the, the, uh, the, the, the step of pushing data down through some uh, known region is, is better behaved than the, the step that I showed you. But still, I mean, the, the error will accumulate if you try to do some layer stripping. And it might be very hard to do it in practice. And uh, I mean, this is a sort of explanation why the region looks funny. So, um, <clears throat> so what, uh, I mean, we actually computed the, the speed of sound in, in a coordinate system that looks like this. So here, uh, the, the vertical lines are, are rays that starts normally from the surface and then propagate down. And the horizontal lines are sort of isosurfaces for the travel time. So Exactly. That is exactly the reason why we don't want to go deeper for this computation. So the coordinate system actually degenerates here because there is a focusing behind the lens. So, uh, so the, the, the method sort of works in a way that you recover everything in these coordinates first and then in principle you can iterate. So you push the data down and do the next layer. Because when you do the next layer, the, the coordinate system doesn't degenerate in the same place. Okay. So, okay, so that's sort of the, uh, these are the pictures of recon recon reconstructions. And um, I will say just a few rough words about uh, how this works in practice. So in practice, uh, the computations are based on solving some, uh, some quadratic optimization problems. So they are not that hard to implement computationally, but you need to solve a lot of them. And they are unstable. So, so these are, uh, in fact, control problems for the wave equation. So what we, what we say here is that, um, okay, so let's take our wave equation. We have the source and the boundary. We want to drive uh, the wave field at fixed time, capital T, close to some uh, prescribed uh, function, phi. So that's the first term. And then the second term is just a typical uh, regularization. So we just use some, some, some simple L2 regularization. So this, this sort of prevents the, uh, the energy of the source to blow up. And, but there is a, I mean, the theory says that if you, if you solve this and, and push the regularization parameter to, uh, to zero, uh, then uh, you actually reach this function phi. And that follows from this unstable unique continuation result. Now, in general, we, I mean, if I just choose any function, I don't know how to, how to compute this, this, how to set up this minimization problem without knowing the speed of sound, right? Because, I mean, how to solve this equation if you don't know the speed of sound? But there is a trick. So if, if I choose this, this target function, phi, to be harmonic, then, in fact, you can just uh, manipulate this expression and see that uh, you, can, you can rewrite this uh, minimization problem as a, as a linear problem, right? I mean, you just write the normal equations or all the Lagrange equations for this. Uh, you get a linear system, and, and you can express this uh, operator appearing in the linear system by just using the, this Dirichlet to Neumann map lambda that encodes the data. So you don't need to know the speed of sound in order to solve this, this system. The, the same thing is true for this right-hand side B. So you can, again, write this explicitly in terms of your data without any reference to the wave speed. So this allows you to solve this problem. And then, uh, in fact, in our numerics, we just choose the simplest possible harmonic function. So that's function that is constant one throughout the whole medium. But we put in some, uh, let's say, clever time windowing or support conditions for the source when we do this minimization problem. And that allows us to produce 
waves that, that localize at some fixed time. So, uh, so now this is a, a solution to this uh, control problem using certain uh, time windowing and so on at fixed time. So this is a, a picture in space. Um, this is not, I guess, in the same wave speed, but maybe in constant wave speed just to, to, to sort of make things uh, easy to explain. So uh, what we want to do is we want to construct waves so that at fixed time they, they localize in this sort of gap-like region. So in theory, the, uh, I mean, there is a theorem that says that when you push the regularization parameter to zero and, and refine and refine, I mean, let the discretization goes, go to infinity, in principle, you should be able to make this to converge so that here in the cap you have one and elsewhere you have zero. But in practice, it is extremely hard to, to get rid of these shadow regions here that in principle should converge to zero. Um, <clears throat> and that's where the sort of the instability of the control problem or, and the whole method in a sense shows up. Okay, but I mean anyway, we get, I mean, just doing this we get still fairly good reconstruction that I showed you. Now, uh, Martin asked me to to make some connection to uh, machine learning, and this is maybe a bit strained connection. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, if you look at these uh, localized waves that uh, were in the previous slide, so uh, <clears throat> it's really hard to get rid of these shadow regions, as I said. So, so these are sort of unstable computations. Uh, if you just want to localize on a, on a half disk, that seems to be computationally completely stable. So there are no, I mean, this is essentially one in the disk and essentially zero outside. Uh, we don't have any mathematical, I mean, we don't have very good mathematical explanation why this happens. So, uh, I mean, the estimates that we have for these control problems are actually as bad for this problem as for the other one. But in practice, this looks much, much better, right? I mean, this looks essentially perfect. So there is, a, I mean, there is a mathematical question. I mean, can you somehow quantify this? And, um, but, okay, so let's just uh, look this from the practical point of view. So, the, so there are certain features like this. So we can, we can now use these to, let's say, compute some volumes, or we can con consider differences of this and consider some volumes over shells, or we can even differentiate if we are careful and compute uh, volumes over spheres uh, in, the, in the geodesic sense, so with respect to the travel time metric. And, and then, in principle, we could use such volumes as, as features that we feed into some local optimization method. For instance, uh, for some uh, maybe neural network uh, type of method. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's a bit strange connection. So, so in principle, we can, ex it seems that in, uh, oh, okay, not in principle, but in practice, it seems that uh, we can extract some very stable quantities that are close to the quantities that we actually use in the, in the, in the mathematically justified method. And, and my question is, uh, could this be used as, as, as good features for some, uh, some other method? And I guess maybe this is slightly related to the, to the remark by Karula, where she said that it's, it's, it's probably not a good idea to try and train your network to do something like a inverse Radon transform. So we are not quite there, but sort of close by. Okay, so let me just uh, uh, summarize everything that I said. So there were basically two parts in my talk. Uh, <clears throat> so the first part was this sort of theoretical result showing that uh, Green's function can be recovered completely from these noise correlations, at least in this, uh, in this uh, model case that I considered. And there, was, there were two steps. So there was a simple integration that gives this inner product. So that's certainly something that you can uh, implement computationally, but we haven't tried it that, but I mean, it's clear that this is uh, completely easy. So then there is this uh, more, bit more complicated step that isolates one factor from these inner products. And uh, we have only mathematical proof that it's possible to isolate one factor but we haven't developed an algorithm for that. 
And then in this sort of second part, where I already sort of reduced everything to the Green's function by using this scheme, I showed you some actual numerical simulations. But the, maybe the main message is that, okay, al the algorithm can be shown to be correct, so it certainly converges to the right uh, speed of sound, but it's unstable. And we are forced to trade resolution for stability in the computations. And, and then, of course, the, the question is, I mean, how to do this in the cleverest, I mean, in, in, in the best possible manner, right? And maybe the best possible manner is actually not to go all the way with this uh, mathematical reconstruction, but sort of slightly stop short uh, and, and uh, feed some uh, features in, into some uh, local data fitting that can be computed stably using the sort of the methods sort of inspired by the, by the actual mathematical proof. Okay, so let me end here.